We want to continue our study tonight of the prodigal son, a young man who came to himself and came home to his father. In outlining Luke chapter 15 and the parable of the prodigal son, we've noted three things. First of all, the rebellion of the prodigal son. Secondly, the repentance of the prodigal son. And finally, the restoration of the prodigal son. In the morning lesson, we talked about a pitiful father, a father who was full of pity for his son and who welcomed his son back home. Tonight, we want to begin by noting a proud brother who gave uh, this young man a far different reception uh, when he came home. We call this the parable of the prodigal son, but it could rightfully be called the parable of the prodigal sons. Because this is the story of two sons and not one. Both of them are prodigals. Both of them are away from their father. Both of them are not living as they ought to be living. One is outwardly disobeying his father. The other is inwardly doing so. They both are rebellious. They both are disrespectful. In fact, we will see the disrespect of the elder brother as we move through the lesson tonight. Now, it is true that the elder brother's sins seem to be more respectable than what the younger son's sins were. They tend to be sins that we don't judge quite as harshly as others. We tend to be very, very hard on sins like promiscuity, sins that involve lust, fornication, adultery, those kinds of things. And we tend to be rather easy on sins like pride. But God hates them both. And both of them are transgressions against the Father. And the Father rejects those who are guilty of either one of these. Now, when we look at this parable, we have to understand the basis for this parable. Luke chapter 15 and verses 1 and 2 tells us that the publicans and sinners were coming to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees did not like that. They did not like the fact that Jesus received publicans and sinners and that he ate with them. And so they are reacting against that. Jesus tells these parables, and in telling these parables, he's representing both the publicans and the sinners as well as the Pharisees. In the parable before us, the prodigal son represents the publicans and sinners. He is the one that commits outward sins. He is the one that's guilty of gross, immoral sins. The elder brother represents the Pharisees. Not guilty of those outward sins, but guilty of sins of the heart. Guilty of the sin of pride. Guilty of the, the sin of selfishness. Guilty of those kinds of sins. So you have to understand what each person in this parable represents. Now you have to understand that the Pharisees also are in the far country. It isn't merely the publicans and sinners that are away from God. The Pharisees are also away from God. They're separated from God by their sins also. And it is interesting that by the time we get to the story's end, the prodigal son will be safe and sound. He'll be back in the father's house, fully restored to the father's love. But the elder brother will still be on the outside. He still will not be right with his father, even as this parable comes to a close. And it was true that the publicans and sinners were far more receptive of Jesus, who listened to Jesus and responded to Jesus far better than what the Pharisees did. And so the publicans and sinners came into the kingdom of God, but the Pharisees stood on the outside. Sometimes we talk about someone on the outside looking in. But in the case before us, the elder brother is on the outside, but I don't even believe that he's looking in. I think he's turned away from the father's house. He's looking into the far country. He, in his arrogance, he, in his pride, has turned his back on the father and turned his back on his brother. As this parable draws to a close, we have the father pleading with him, begging him to come to the feast to enter in. That's exactly what's happening as Jesus is telling these parables. The publicans and sinners are coming in, but the Pharisees are not. And Jesus is pleading with them. Jesus is begging them to come to the feast. We have no, uh, no reason to believe that they accepted that invitation. 
Now, there are a lot of people who read the parable of the prodigal son. And they wonder why Jesus did not end this parable with the return of the prodigal son. We like stories that end with, and they lived happily ever after. And this story could have ended that way. The prodigal son goes in the far country, he comes to himself, he comes home to his father, he's received by his father, and so why not just end the story there? That way this parable ends on a very positive, a very happy note. But this parable doesn't end that way. This parable ends with an arrogant brother, a prideful brother, an angry brother on the outside. It ends with this, this family problem rather than the resolution with the prodigal son coming home. Now why didn't Jesus end the parable with the return of the prodigal son? Well, number one, he did not end the parable that way because that's not the reason why he told the story to begin with. He told the story to make a point to the Pharisees, to make a point to the elder brother. And so it's natural that he would end with the elder brother and with the Pharisees. But there's another reason why Jesus did not end this story that way. You remember the story begins with the fact that the father had two sons, and he loved both of those sons. When the story comes to an end, only one son is safe and sound. Only one son is within the father's house. The other one is still on the outside. And so the father loved the one on the outside every bit as much as he loved the one on the inside. He loved the elder brother just as much as he loved the younger brother. But it was simply the younger brother who responded to the invitation and came home. The elder brother did not. Now as we examine this parable tonight and as we examine a proud brother, we want to see three things. First of all, we want to see the anger of this elder brother. Then we want to see the arrogance of this elder brother. And finally, we want to see the accusation of this elder brother. Now, when you read through the parable, at least through the majority of the parable, the first uh, half or better of the parable, if I were to ask you about the elder brother and what you think about the elder brother, likely your comments of him would be positive. He seems to be the good son. He seems to be the son who is respectful of his father. He seems to be the son who is at home doing what his father needs for him to do. He seems to be the son that's more mature. He seems to be the son that's more hardworking. But when we get to the end of this parable, we will find that this son, in fact, is not better than his brother. In fact, by the end, he is actually in worse, a worse condition. Now, when we look at this part of our story tonight, we examine this elder brother. Notice in verse 25, it says, Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. Now, notice where this elder son was. This elder son was in the field. He was out in the field working, laboring, serving, probably in in the role of an overseer, probably not physically laboring with his own hands, but overseeing servants and making sure that certain things got done. We would say that's what we want in a son. That's what we would expect this son to be doing. He's the good son. But I want you to understand that what this elder son was doing He wasn't doing out of love for his father. He wasn't doing it because he loved his father or he respected his father or he wanted to serve his father. In fact, what he was doing, he was doing for his own benefit. It was very self-serving in nature. This elder son, by this time in the story, he owned the Ponderosa. It was his. It wasn't his father's. He's not working for his father anymore. He's working for himself. The father's already divided the goods to his sons. He's gotten his portion just like the younger son got his portion. This all belongs to him. That's the point that the father's going to make to him at the end of this. He's not working for the father at all. He's working for himself. He's serving himself. He's doing what he wants to do. You don't need to miss that as you move through this parable. Now, when he comes home, he is going to reveal to his father that he resents the service that he has been rendering. He resents it. 
He's not enjoyed it. He doesn't like it. He doesn't want to do it. Very resentful of his father. And that will come out. But when he comes home, he hears music and dancing. Music and dancing. And he calls a servant, probably the child of one of the servants. They also were considered servants. The servants likely would have been uh, at the banquet serving in some way, but those that were younger would not have been on the in inside. But they would have been nearby. They would have wanted to hear the music. They would have been wanted to be around the, the celebration that was taking place. He calls one of those young servants over, and he wants to know, what does the music mean? What does all this joy mean? What's going on? And the servant's going to explain to him that his brother has come. Verse 27, he said unto him, Thy brother has come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. Now, the servant doesn't say anything about the best robe. He doesn't say anything about the ring. He doesn't say anything about the sandals. He doesn't tell him anything about those things. He simply says, your brother's come. Your father's killed the fatted calf. Your brother is safe and sound. Now, we would assume that the reaction of the elder brother at that point would have been one of joy. Would have been much like the reaction of the father. My brother's okay. My brother's home. Rejoicing, But that was not at all his reaction. His reaction was one of anger. Now think about what this represents. When the publicans and the sinners are responding to Jesus, they're listening to what Jesus teaches, and they're, they're obeying Jesus, what would you expect the reaction of the Pharisees to be? One of joy. Here are these sinners, outward sinners, gross sinners, and now they're changing their ways. You would have assumed that the Pharisees would have rejoiced over that. But they don't at all rejoice over that. They're very resentful. They can't understand why Jesus is receiving these publicans and sinners and treating them the way that he is. Now this elder brother is angry at many people. He's angry at the world, really, if you want to be honest about it. He's angry with everyone and anyone. He's angry with his brother, but he seems to be more angry with God, more angry with his father than anyone else. His strongest words are going to be for his father. When these publicans and sinners are responding to Jesus, hearing him and obeying him and changing their ways, who do the Pharisees get angry with? Do they get angry with the publicans and sinners? Oh, they don't like them. But their greatest anger isn't for them. Their greatest anger is directed toward Jesus. How dare you receive them? How dare you take them in? How, how dare you have anything to do with them? You see, this elder brother represents the Pharisees and represents their attitude in this. Now, it is true that this elder brother did not love his younger brother. No question about that. He didn't love him. Had he loved him, his reaction would have been very different than it was. He does not love his younger brother. In fact, he seems to have been more bothered by the killing of the fatted calf than he would have been had news come from the far country that his brother had been killed. He wasn't concerned about his brother. But he'll bring up the fatted calf a couple of times. It bothers him. His father's killed the fatted calf. Loves that fatted calf more than he loves his brother. Now, I want you to make a comparison here. There is a prodigal son that we read about in the Old Testament. Of course, that prodigal son is called, named Jonah. You remember the story of Jonah. And Jonah really is, is the prodigal son and the elder brother all rolled into one. If you could take both of those two characters and press them together, you'd have Jonah, because he was both. He was the prodigal son. You remember he tried to run from God and he was headed for the far country. He's rebellious. He's the prodigal son. But he's also the elder brother. As we move through that story, especially as we get to Jonah chapter 4, Jonah is angry. And who's he angry with? Angry with the Ninevites? Well, he doesn't like the Ninevites, but his anger is directed toward God. God, this is the reason why I headed for the fourth country to begin with. I knew that you were a gracious God, and I knew that if they so much as thought about repenting, you'd forgive them. And God, I wanted them destroyed. 
You remember that Jonah, even when he finds out that God is not going to destroy Nineveh, he goes outside of the city and he sets up a little booth. He won't enter into the city. He doesn't want anything to do with this city. He'll be on the outside. Now, who does that remind you of? The elder brother. He won't enter in. He'll stay on the outside. That's Jonah's attitude. We're seeing this attitude lived again. But think about Jonah. Jonah loved that gourd vine. You remember the gourd vine that came up that provided shade for him? And then a worm came and bit that gourd vine and it died. And Jonah was very displeased. He was very bothered by the death of that gourd vine. But he didn't care anything about the death of all of those people in the city of Nineveh. That didn't bother him at all. But the death of a gourd vine really bothered him. This elder brother... The death of his younger brother, that wouldn't have bothered him. But the death of that fatted calf, oh, that troubled him. Why? Why did my dad do that? Why did he take him back? Why did he receive him that way? His elder brother is so much like Jonah in his boycotting this banquet, refusing to come in. Now, this elder brother's anger hurts a number of people. First and foremost, it hurts him. The Bible teaches us that our, our debts are forgiven as we forgive our debtors, Matthew 6 and verse 12, and that if we forgive others their trespasses, then God will forgive us our trespasses, but if we don't forgive others their trespasses, He won't forgive us our trespasses, Matthew 6, 14 and 15. The Bible teaches us that if we want judgment with mercy, then we have to show mercy, James chapter 2, and that mercy rejoiceth against judgment, but if we don't show mercy, then we can't receive mercy. And so this elder brother is angry, and his anger hurts a number of people. But first and foremost, his anger hurts him. Because his anger puts him in a position to where he can't be forgiven. His anger puts him in a position to where he won't receive mercy. But think about as well that his anger hurts his father. His father loved both of his sons. He wanted both of his sons to be safe and sound. He wanted both of his sons to be a part of this celebration. And just as soon as he gets the younger son home, the elder son refuses to come in. Here's Jesus. Jesus is teaching and preaching, and the publicans and sinners are coming in. They're finally responding to the message, but here are the Pharisees who refuse to come in. They're staying on the outside. Now, God loved the publicans and sinners, but he also loved the Pharisees. He loved both. And he wanted both to come in. All were invited to the feast. But only the publicans and sinners were responding to that. Think about how this must have hurt the father, that the elder brother refused to come in. You know, the father doesn't show either son preferential treatment. When the younger son comes home, the father runs to meet him. When the elder brother refuses to come in, the father goes out to meet him. He goes out to entreat him, to reason with him. There's no favoritism being shown here. In fact, he had to leave the party in order to go out and deal with this elder brother. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of how many times today preachers and elders have to leave the celebration to go out to deal with someone who has their feelings hurt, or someone who's upset or bothered by this or that, or someone who just has their feathers ruffled in some way, and rather than doing the things that we ought to be doing, we're spending our time trying to entreat those who are angry and won't come in. Sad. But Jesus, of course, dealt with that. He told this parable about that. So his anger was hurting himself, number one. It was hurting his father, number two. But it was hurting his brother, number three. We're not told what the prodigal's reaction was to his brother's rejection, to his brother's refusal to come in. But it must have hurt him. Here's this young man who's come home. Here's this young man who's trying to do right. Here's this young man who's trying to start his life over again. And his own brother won't help him. In fact, his own brother seems to not have any faith, any confidence in him at all. You read Luke chapter 15, and everyone in this chapter experiences joy except for one person. 
The shepherd, joy. The woman, joy. The father, joy. There's one character in Luke 15 who doesn't experience any joy. And that's the elder brother. You know, the most miserable people in all the world are the people who are unforgiving. They're the most miserable people in the world. The people who are arrogant and angry, they're the most miserable people in the world. This elder brother's miserable. And his misery is inflicted upon other people, including his own brother. But let's talk about his arrogance. You notice in verse 29 of Luke chapter 15, his father comes out and entreats him. Verse 29, And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. It's easy to see his arrogance here, and it's interesting to see how this son sees the world. Have you ever tried to see the world through somebody else's eyes? To try to see things the way that they see them? I want you to, to for just a minute, to try to see the world the way that the elder brother sees the world. It will reveal some things to you, primarily about him. First of all, I want you to consider how he saw his father. How does this elder son see his father? Notice how he begins in verse 29. He said to his father, Lo. We probably don't get the full import of this word in the translation. The word lo literally means look. You ever been talking to someone and someone just kind of turned on you and said, Look, that's what this son does to his father. He says, Look, all these years I've served you. All these years I've done everything you've asked me to do. Look, Dad. And, and the idea is that this son is telling his father, Okay, I've put up with this as long as I'm going to put up with this. It's time for me to show you how things really are. I want you to see how the world really operates. Dad, you're out of touch. He's going to enlighten his old man. He's going to show his old man, here's what really ought to be done. I know what you've done, but here's what you should have done. Now think about how this relates to the Pharisees. Here's Jesus receiving these publicans and sinners... And here are the Pharisees going, look, Jesus, here's the way you ought to treat them. Here's what you ought to do with them. Rather than what you are doing with them, here's the way that you ought to handle them or ought to treat them. Romans chapter 2 and verses 19 and 20 shows the attitude that the Pharisees had. Paul captures this attitude. Paul knew this attitude firsthand. He had been one of them. And notice what he says of them. And art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Paul says, you're confident. You're extremely arrogant is a better way to say that. He says, here's what you think about yourself. You're a guide of the blind. Here's this son saying to his father, let me guide you. Let me show you the way things really are. A light to them which are in darkness. The Pharisees saw themselves as the enlightened ones. Everyone else was in the dark. This son says to his father, Dad, you're in the dark. Let me enlighten you. Let me tell you the way things really are. An instructor of the foolish. Dad, you're acting foolishly. Let me give you some wisdom. That's the attitude of this young man. A teacher of babes. He's saying to his dad... Dad, I guess I'm going to have to be the father. I guess I'm going to have to be the one to set down the rules and do the right thing. You're not doing this. We've reversed roles here. There's the attitude of this son toward his father. It's very disrespectful. It's very condescending. But I want you to see as well how he saw his brother. Notice how he sees his brother in Luke chapter 15. He says in verse 30, But as soon as this thy son was come. Notice he doesn't say, As soon as this my brother was come. 
He said, as soon as this thy son was come, he won't even claim him as his brother. He's your son. He's not my brother. You can take full credit for him. I don't want anything to do with him. That's the attitude. Now, the father is going to correct him. Notice in verse 32, when the father says, It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother. You quit calling him my son. He's your brother. You got the attitude of Cain. Cain said, Who's my brother? Am I my brother's keeper? And God said, absolutely you are. Absolutely you have a responsibility to your brother. That's what this father is saying to the elder son. You have a responsibility to your brother. He is your brother whether you like it or not. And you only have a responsibility whether you like it or not. This thy brother, the father says. Notice that this elder son cast his brother in the most negative light he possibly can. He says, but as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots. He's your son, and he's devoured your living, and he's done it with harlots. And isn't it interesting that up until this point in the story, we haven't heard anything about harlots? Not until the elder brother brings them up. Now, now, granted, the younger son went to the far country and wasted his substance with riotous living, and it seems to me that very well could have included harlots. That's the kind of living we're talking about. We don't read about harlots there. We don't read about them until the elder brother brings them up. How does he know this? Does he know this at all? Jesus doesn't correct him. He isn't corrected in the story by the Father, and so it may very well be true. But even if it is true, why is he bringing it up? Think about where we are in this story. This young man's already come home. He's already confessed his sin. He's already been forgiven by his father. He's already been taken back. The celebration's already been planned. So why are you bringing up wasting his substance with harlots? That's not a part of him anymore. That's been left in the past. But... This elder brother is never going to leave that in the past. Publicans and sinners are always going to be publicans and sinners as far as they're concerned. Drunks are always going to be drunks. Fornicators are always going to be fornicators. Never going to be anything but that as far as they're concerned. Why? Because they have a holier-than-thou attitude. You don't live up to my standard? You don't live up to what I, I say? I never will accept you as anything other than that. That's not the way the father takes the son back. It's not the way we are supposed to take people back. But it's the way that the elder brother um, would, would, would look at his, at his own brother. We see how he saw his father. We see how he saw his brother. But now let's see how he saw himself. Notice he says in verse 29, He answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. He doesn't say anything about being his father's son. He simply talks about being his father's servant. These many years. Now, generally speaking, when someone begins with these many years, what are they doing? These many years. This service that he's rendered to his father, does it seem long or does it seem short? It seems awfully long, these many years. Let me give you an example from the Old Testament. You remember that Jacob met Rachel, worked out this deal with Laban. I want her, I'll, I'll serve you these many years for her. Remember what the Bible says about that? It seemed as... No time at all. Why? Because he was more than willing to work for her. Seven years, that's nothing. I can do that without any trouble at all. If I get her at the end, it seemed like a short time because he was getting her. But this son, he doesn't look at his father's command that way. Oh, it's not a short time, it's a long time. I've served you many years. Why? Because I didn't want to do it.
You know, a job that you really want to do, something that you really enjoy doing, doesn't seem nearly as hard as something you don't want to do. This son didn't want to do this. That's why it seems so hard to him. But think about as well. He says, these many years do I serve thee. The word serve here could very well be translated slave. These many years do I slave for thee. The younger son came home and he had the full intention of saying to his father, make me as one of your hired servants. I, I just want to be a hired servant. The elder brother had been at home the whole time and he had felt like a hired servant the whole time. He never felt like a son. Felt like a hired servant. Tonight, if it's the case that you feel like a hired servant instead of a son, then I'm afraid you're not going to make it to heaven. There are so many people who are doing what they do because they feel like they have to, not because they want to. They give because they feel like they have to, not because they want to. They attend because they feel like they have to, not because they want to. They're, they're looking at, at service to God as the role of a slave rather than as a son. It is true that we're bond slaves. We've made ourselves willingly bond slaves to Jesus Christ. But we are sons. And we need to understand the relationship that we have to our Father. This elder brother never saw that. He saw his father as a hard man, Matthew 25 and verse 24, as a hard man, one that could not be pleased. He says as well that he never transgressed, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. Remember what John says in 1 John chapter 1, if we say that we have no sin, we lie and we do not the truth. John says, we're not telling the truth if we say that. This young man said that, right? I didn't transgress your commandments at any time. You know what John would say to that? Liar. You're lying. You did. But you know what the Pharisees would have said if you had said, have you disobeyed God? No, we didn't disobey God at any time. We've always done everything God wanted us to do. That's what this elder son said. At this very moment, he was disobeying his father. His father had asked him to come in, and he said, I won't. I'm not coming in. The Pharisees at this very moment were disobeying Jesus. Jesus said, come to the feast, and they said, we won't do it. As long as you're receiving these publicans and sinners, we're not coming in. Now they would say, like the rich young ruler, all these years have I kept thy commandments. What lack I yet? Jesus would tell them, but they weren't willing to do that. We see their arrogance in the way that they saw themselves. You know, he could see his brother's sins. He could see his brother wasting that living with harlots, but he couldn't see his own sin. It reminds me of Luke chapter 18. You remember the Pharisee and the publican that went up to prayer, and the Pharisee stood and he prayed thus with himself, saying, God, I thank Thee that I'm not like other men. That's what his elder brother said. I'm not like my younger brother. Don't put me in the same category he's in. I'm not like him. And I thank you that I'm not like him. You see the attitude that he has. But finally, let's talk about the accusation. Verses 29 through 32, he's going to make an accusation against his father. He says in verse 29, Yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. You never gave me a kid. You gave him one just as soon as he comes home, verse 30. You didn't even put him on probation. You didn't even make him wait. Just as soon as he comes home, you killed a fatted calf for him. But you never did that for me. You see the favoritism? Father, he's your favorite. You're giving him privileges you never gave to me. 
the fact of the matter is, according to Luke 15 and verse 12, they both had received the goods. Notice he divided unto them his living. The younger son got his portion, but the elder son got his portion, which was, of course, a double portion. So for this elder son to tell his father, you never gave me a kid, was a lie. I told you he was a liar. He's lying. Because when the father divided the substance, he got a double portion of all of the kids, of all of the flocks and herds. They were his. He could do with them what he wanted to do with them. He could have killed one every day if he wanted to. Notice what the father is going to say to him. Verse 31, he said to him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It all belongs to you. You own the Ponderosa. It's yours. It's not mine. You could have killed a, a fatted calf any time you wanted to. He just haven't done that, but he's accusing his father of favoritism. He's accusing the father of giving the younger son a party, but he never gave him a party. Well, let's talk about this party for just a minute. The elder son misrepresents this celebration. He, he presents this celebration as a, a party for the prodigal and all of his friends. He says, Thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. In other words, you've given him a kid so that he can make merry with his friends. I want you to understand from Luke chapter 15, this was not the prodigal son's party. It wasn't. It was the father's party. You go up through Luke chapter 15, you find the shepherd that finds his sheep, the woman who finds her coin. They invite their friends, their neighbors, to come and rejoice with them. It's their celebration. Come rejoice with me because I found my sheep. Come rejoice with me because I found my coin. Come rejoice with me because I have found my son. It's not the prodigal's party. It's the father's. You see, he's misrepresenting what this party is. It's not a celebration of this young man at all. It's a celebration of the father and the fact that the father has his child back again. The Pharisees were angry with God. They were angry with Jesus because Jesus was receiving publicans and sinners. And they were acting as if Jesus was condoning what they were doing. He never did. He never said that what the publicans and sinners were doing was right. He never received them on those grounds. He never acted as if he was. He never threw them a party for who they were. No, the rejoicing was on his part that they had come into the kingdom. And I want you to think about verse 32, and we'll end our lesson tonight with this. The Father says, It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. It was meet. The Father says, It was right for us to do this. Jesus said, It's right for me to take the public and send sinners in. Why? Because they're coming, repenting. They're coming, changing their ways. It's right for me to take them in. They were dead and now they're alive. They were lost and now they're found. What are we supposed to do when people come home? We're supposed to rejoice. We're supposed to rejoice. That's the right thing to do. And if we do anything other than that, we're not doing the right thing. When somebody comes home, if we don't rejoice with them, then we fall into the category of the elder brother rather than the loving father. We don't want to be in the category of the elder brother. We don't want to be in the category of the Pharisees. We want to be in the category of Jesus and those who have come to Him. Tonight we extend the invitation of our Lord. We want to give you the opportunity to come home as the prodigal did. We want to extend the invitation tonight even to those who fall in the category of the elder brother. Those who are angry. Those who are arrogant. Those who, who think God's not been fair. Oh, the invitation's extended to you too. 
You see, He's inviting you to come to the feast. The, the Father has come outside in order to try to convince you to come in. We don't know what the elder brother did. The story ends before we're ever told. Did his father finally get through to him? Did his father finally help him to see how wrong he was in the way that he was viewing things? Or did the father plead in vain? I don't know. I don't know. But you know, that day has long since passed. But tonight, the father pleads with us. The elder brother's long gone. The prodigal's long gone. But we're here tonight. Some of us have come home and we're safe and sound. Some of us are on the outside. And because of anger, because of arrogance, because of accusations, whatever it may be, we haven't come in. The Father's pleading for us to do so. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Will you repent of your sins and turn away from them? Will you make the good confession that He is God's Son and be immersed in water for every sin to be washed away? That's the only way you can come home. As an alien sinner, you're separated from God. If you want to come home, that's what you have to do. But then there's the elder brother. Then there's the person that is at home but isn't right with God. A child of God that isn't right with God. Here's the opportunity for you to get right with God by changing your mind. That's what repentance is. It's a change of the mind brought about by godly sorrow which results in a reformation of life. That's repentance. That's what the elder brother had to do if he wanted to be restored. He had to change his mind about his father. He had to change his mind about his brother. He had to do that because he was sorry because of the way that he had thought about his father and thought about his brother and talked about his father and talked about his brother and, and what he had done. He had to be sorry for that. If he would do that and change his life, then he could come in. He could be restored. Tonight, that's your opportunity. 1 John 1, 7-9. If you'll come, we invite you to as we stand, as we sing.